Thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, all those things. Um, but uh, another thing about that was I founded the company in my garage 10 years ago, and we did interactive web stuff. And if you did interactive web stuff 10 years ago, what were you using? Anybody? Flash, yeah, it was a whole lot of Flash. And uh, so a few years back, that changed a little bit, slightly. And um, we kind of disappeared off into app development land. We did server development. Um, we weathered the change pretty well. Um, we had done uh, web development before then, but it just, you know, there was only so much you could do. Um, we, you know, we'd do some jQuery, some backbone, but then we got a, a project, and uh, this project was called Space Forensics. It was a government contract, one of the only times being in DC has been helpful. Uh, it was for an educational game. It was a LucasArts style adventure game for freaking NASA. So, yay, as a geek, this was amazing. This was such a cool, cool project to land. Um, but they had certain requirements of it being online, on the web, and um, HTML5, all of the stuff that, quite frankly, we hadn't played that deeply in for a few years. And so, you know, we're thinking, great, we'll build our own tool chain, we'll figure out how to do this. We sort of peer into where web dev was at that point and what the hell happened. Everything had changed a lot, and that's what this talk is about, is coming back into the world of web development after being gone for a while and trying to make sense of it, trying to deal with the insanity of the ecosystem. And I don't mean insanity and, and insane in a bad way necessarily, it's just really different from most other software development ecosystems for a lot of reasons. Um, the fact of the matter was is that I feel like I'm taking crazy pills trying to work with JavaScript when we first came into it. Because um, what started as this small, really poorly named scripting language for Netscape is huge now. It's really hard to evaluate things because they're constantly changing. Um, as such, any kind of recommendations that you, you get about it kind of are instantly dated. I'm still gonna try and tell you what we're using to make cool stuff. Um, but more than that, I'm hoping to show you guys a little bit more, sort of teach you how to fish. Like how we went through this process of coming to terms with where JavaScript is now and how we're constantly evaluating what we want to use to build awesome stuff. Because at the end of the day, that's the main goal. It's not about using the coolest JavaScript. It's about building the best things for human beings. Now, to understand and for, for me to get my team all the way on board with kind of where everything was, I had to go over some history even with them to see where we were. Now, you have all of the ways that, that JavaScript came to be that most people know. Um, Mocha, then LiveScript, then they call it JavaScript to ride Java's coattails. I still don't understand that one. Um, and then it became a standard relatively early on. And I think this is one of the biggest reasons that JavaScript both is so amazing and had this really bad, weird period from about 1999 to about 2009, which was this big, big power struggle. Um, you know, use plugins for non-trivial interactivity. Um, I can honestly say that I made and deployed some stuff using Shockwave. Yeah. I need my AARP card now, I think. Um, I don't know if that works in Canada. Do you guys have AARP up here? No? It retired people conglomerate <laughs> thing. Yeah, so, sorry. Um, and there were big fights over ECMAScript v4. Uh, it was really, really ugly. And one of the things that's not as super well known is that um, there was a whole spec made. And um, the, the various things that happened was uh, <laughs> something called ActionScript 3, which was the essentially prototype for what was going to be uh, a version of ECMAScript. And there was just tons of infighting about this, and it got entirely scrapped, and then there were multiple different attempts to make the next version of JavaScript. And it was kind of a, a fight for the soul of the language. 
Was it going to be strongly typed and object-oriented? Were there going to be namespaces? Was it going to look like Java? Was it going to look more? And all of the, the leading people that were pushing JavaScript just didn't agree. And it got quite ugly, and nothing really happened with the language for basically a decade, um, which obviously in web years is a hell of a long time. And this is why Flash became a thing. And once everybody kind of got their stuff together, <laughs> it's also part of why Flash died, and rightfully so. But in the meantime, the JavaScript community wasn't quiet, right? It, it wasn't just sitting on its haunches the whole time. Um, Ajax uh, premiered as a thing. You know, I, I think the, the single function changing it all of XML HTTP request was a, it was a big deal. It was a really, really big deal, let alone the intelligent marketing of Ajax, because God knows that rolls off the tongue a lot better than XML HTTP request. Plus, who was, what was the last time you loaded XML over Ajax? Um, and so it began this whole thing where JavaScript was using People were using JavaScript to fix holes in JavaScript, which began a whole big ball rolling. Um, smoothing over cross-platform issues, all of those sorts of things. And then starting to bring really common patterns to JavaScript, talking about uh, promises, observables, um, events, all of these things that, that um, weren't necessarily initially built in the language but people still wanted to build with. Then, of course, you have Node. And Node comes in and starts kicking ass. Um, and starting to be able to put JavaScript absolutely anywhere. I know I've seen little board Arduino-like boards now that can run JavaScript. Um, and for me, this was pretty exciting watching this happen, because again, we'd been working in Python a lot. And so we saw, oh, hey, this is like twisted for uh, JavaScript. You can build anything you want entirely in JavaScript. Uh, and then the big thing that came, in my mind, was NPM. There being a package manager for JavaScript resulted in this absolutely amazing explosion. And the, I'm, I'm a big fan of metaphors, and I've been trying to come up with the right one to explain how this affected JavaScript. And being a sort of science geek, one of the things uh, I, I look at and, and like a lot are, are dinosaurs and, and uh, uh, fossils and all that stuff. And in the Earth's history, there was this thing called the Cambrian Explosion. If you've never heard of it, it was this just gigantic explosion of life. We don't know why it happened, but all of the, the uh, anima animal phyla that we have now came from that period. And all kinds of weird shit came to be. And uh, most of it died out. Most of it wasn't really fit for, for surviving. But it, th this amazing evolutionary explosion was still really important in the history of our planet. And we had the same kind of thing happening now with Node and NPM. It's this explosion of stuff. But that's also why it's kind of anxiety-inducing right now, because there's so much stuff. And it's hard to figure out what's good and what's bad. Right? Um, I would have bet on trilobites. They'd been around for a long time. These, these, uh, uh, they look like big cockroaches, and they've been around forever. And they just they didn't end up surviving. There's a lot of those kinds of things happening with JavaScript. The thing is, is that when you look at this number, it just it's hitting that hockey stick. It's just going more and more and more, more and more JavaScript modules. Um, I, I recorded in this case. Um, uh, like a week and a half ago or so, and it's already gone up a ton since then. Um, it's easy to publish to NPM. It's incredibly easy to share your stuff. This makes a huge difference. There's zero gatekeeping. Um, there's massive overlap. Quality varies wildly, um, to put it mildly. Um, and there are a lot of, lot of dodos. There's, there's a lot of stuff on NPM that has no future, right? Going through and plucking out what is the good stuff and what is the bad stuff is hard. It's made worse by the fact that so many packages reference other packages. Um, are you guys familiar with the whole left pad thing that happened? Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a mess. Um, basically, uh, you had a whole series of libraries that all imported each other, and they went all the way back to this one tiny, tiny library called left pad that did exactly that. It left padded uh, uh, numbers for you. and um, 
that guy ended up having a fight uh, with, with the NPM folks and pulled his uh, library from NPM, which broke almost everything, it seemed like. Uh, React, tons and tons of other libraries broke because suddenly they couldn't import this library that the guy had pulled. Uh, it, was, it was bad. Um, but the, you get this when you have a huge evolutionary explosion. It, it, it's what happens. So, wait, wait a minute, modules? I've been doing JavaScript for a long time and I come to this and it's like, what do you mean by modules? Um, there wasn't like base language support for this idea. Um, notice the script in JavaScript. In, in many ways it doesn't have, or doesn't, didn't have, I should say, support for kind of programming in the large um, and thinking about how you stick multiple pieces together. So, workarounds. You had common JS on the server and NPM, which is becoming the way you do stuff. You, have, you had AMD in the browser for loading things. Um, and the things are incompatible, so you started to throw JavaScript at the solution. You have things like Browserify, which takes incompatible uh, uh, formats and lets you stick them together to still make JavaScript. So now, for the first time, you need tooling for a language that's a scripting language, where it used to be you just load it in the browser and off you go. Um, and this was one of those, again, weird things coming to this. I'm used to, you, know, you, you put the JS file and you have the script tag. And now, coming into this, I'm finding so many more other options around this for scaffolding out your project, for, for laying out what are your files, how are things arranged, you have Yeoman, you have Slush. For transpiling, this is where things got really interesting and weird for me. Um, coming from a computer science background, uh, I hadn't really ever thought of, of JavaScript as a target language, but in fact, that's how a lot of people are viewing it. Um, you have things like CoffeeScript, TypeScript, Dart, Babel, um, ClosureScript, Elm, where JavaScript isn't really what you're working in. You're working in something else that turns itself into uh, JavaScript. Then you just have the build process of minifying, of doing all of the other stuff you need to do in web development. Um, things like uh, Grunt, Gulp, Webpack, Brunch, um, and you have these, you know, these tools you have to learn as well. And then at the end of the day, there's even more stuff coming on the horizon. Um, if you guys haven't heard of it yet or done much with it, ASM.js is looking like it's going to be really, really interesting. Um, it's essentially a strip, strict subset of JavaScript that acts as a compiler target, specifically so that um, you can turn other languages into things that run in the browser, and ASM.js is set up in such a way so it can run blisteringly fast. So people are compiling C, C++ code, um, other languages into the browser and able to run them really, really fast. So you know, you've seen things uh, like 3D engines and stuff like that being ported over. Um, you have uh, uh, ES6, next generation of JavaScript and, and ES7 after that, um, adding tons of new, beautiful, wonderful things to the language that make it, in my mind, very, very reasonable to work with now. Um, you, know, you, you would kind of hit the edges of, of ES5 pretty quickly, um, in my mind. And uh, then you have stuff like web components coming up um, and uh, uh, HTTP2, which sort of everything you know about loading stuff over HTTP is wrong. Uh, a big part of why you used to make these tool, why you would make these tool chains to combine all your JavaScript into one file is because doing multiple HTTP requests is, is slow and uh, you want your site to load faster. And that's not true with HTTP2. So even our foundation of the stuff we're building on is changing. And I don't know about you, but this makes me anxious. <laughs> This makes me very anxious. Coming into this project I was telling you about and sort of seeing this landscape, um, it made me feel like we're trying to build castles on sand. Um, stuff is constantly changing. I'm having to pick winners from this huge possible cast of options. Um, but I'm here to tell you it can be done, but you have to be smart and you have to be careful with your choices. 
One of the most important things I think I'm going to tell you guys in this talk is that one size does not fit all. It really depends on what you are building. There is no silver bullet. There is no, I will learn this library and I will forever make the best stuff. That doesn't exist. You have to be more curious than that. The first question to look at is, what are you building? Is this a single page app? Is this just injecting some page to make it a little bit more intelligent? How big will this code base be? That really ends up mattering. If you're programming in the large, you need to build things reasonably, I feel. Uh, the kinds of tools that exist in either the transpiled languages like TypeScript or, or ES6. Um, who is your audience? Understanding what devices and people you're targeting is really important. Um, if, for example, uh, uh, you're doing something that needs to be um, uh, compliant for um, users with various forms of disabilities, you need to look at that from the very beginning and understand how you can best use JavaScript. A lot of the single page uh, application stuff doesn't necessarily play that well when you're dealing with um, uh, accessibility issues. And this is an understated thing for me, is what does your team know? Where are they coming from? Not every team uh, is going to have the same background. And understanding the people who you are working with is, is incredibly important. Um, developing software isn't just an intellectual task. It is a social task. So figuring out the best tool for your whole group of people you're working with is incredibly important. And then when is the damn thing new? Um, if you have time to learn something new for a project, I, I can pretty much always recommend that. I like always try to learn something new in every project. But the size and scope of that very much depends on, on when your deadline is. Um, just managing risk. Uh, that's where you, know, you kind of hear boss speak out of me. I'm a developer, but I run the team as well. Um, and then this last one I don't think is thought about enough. How long will your code last, right? Is this a product or is this a project? Is this something that you're just delivering on the short term, it'll be up for a while and then it goes away? Or is this something that other people are going to have to maintain in the future, right? You don't want future you to hate current you. Um, that's a general philosophy that I try to abide by. Um, and the thing is, is, this isn't just a technical problem. This affects hiring, it affects employee morale, it affects internal training, right? This isn't just something where, where if you pick this new way you're going to build stuff, you can um, uh, just say, okay, everybody has to know this new thing now, go. It doesn't work that way, as much as I wish it did. <laughs> so let's actually get into the, the guts of it and uh, uh, really understanding some of these problems, how we approached figuring them out, and uh, what our answers are right now and what they are going into the future. So the first thing that my team went to go tackle was the language we're actually going to write this in, right? There are a lot of interesting pros for transpiled languages. Um, you guys have seen the JavaScript uh, manual and the JavaScript, the good parts. The transpiled languages are just the good parts, right? It's much harder to shoot yourself in the foot or to write really dirty, awful code in these transpiled languages. Um, a lot of them have strong typing, which, again, if you're programming in the large, can be a very valuable thing, can help you avoid a lot of silly, uh, silly errors. Um, they can improve the syntax a lot, just make things easier to read or more familiar to people coming from other languages. Uh, the other thing that they can bring is some real domain specificity. So um, you can, you're building something where the language itself is helping you write good code. There are cons, though. You still need to know JavaScript. At the end of the day, the, the compiler target is not something you can fully ignore. Um, you still need to understand what's going on under the hood. Um, so this is an on top of, and in addition to. Um, I tend to feel that these transpod languages, because they're naturally more similar to each other than not, that they matter less than good coding discipline. If you are good with how clean your code is, uh, how readable it is, um, you can go to any of these languages, um, TypeScript, ClojureScript, whatever, and, uh, and be successful. 
Um, if you're not disciplined, um, I don't think the language is going to save you. Uh, there's more complex tooling you have to deal with. That's another distinct issue. You have to use a transpiler. You have to use some kind of tool chain to get your JavaScript from one thing to another. And you are going to have to do more work in the browser, um, setting up source maps, setting up um, uh, uh, just generally your debugging to, to figure out how to get things to work. And again, you really still have to know JavaScript to do that process. Lastly, there is going to be a longer ramp up. You are going to have to take more time to learn to do this than you would just going from JavaScript. Now, that being said, we still chose to use a transpiled language for that project and for our projects going forward. Um, our choice has been using ES6 um, with Babel. Um, Babel's a tool that allows you to write in future versions of JavaScript now. So for us, it seemed like a really smart investment because we get to learn and work with the next generation of JavaScript that isn't fully supported by browsers yet now. Um, and it gave us all of the nice additions that we really needed, we felt, to program in the large. It, it, it did the job that we needed for that. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with the other languages um, by any means. Um, I tend to be more attracted to the weird ones, uh, Closure Script and Elm, things like that. But TypeScript, from the background of working with Java and working with ActionScript, is very familiar as well. And for example, the Angular guys totally hung their hat on that as, as a way to go forward to program in the large. And I don't necessarily think they're wrong. Um, at the end of the day, I just loved the syntactic sugar that ES6 added, the things like arrow functions, the spread operator. Um, real classes uh, and modules ended up being enough for our needs for developing. And again, we reevaluate this every project. Um, we've been doing ES6 with Babel for a while now and are generally sticking with it, but are pretty happy. Um, the biggest thing here for us, though, is investing in great tooling and really understanding it. Not just taking something off the shelf and running with it, but really understanding every step of the way of how it works, what it's doing, um, and, and really tweaking it for your needs. Um, the best setups for programming, period, end of story, have the tightest feedback loops. The faster you can go from writing some code to seeing how it works, the better. One click to compile and see stuff is great, but no clicks is even better. Um, one thing that we use are, are hot loaders a lot, where the page automatically reloads um, as soon as we, we change the code. I adore using hot loaders. Um, it, makes, it makes it really reasonable to, to write code. You can see what you're doing every step of the way. Um, automate everything. Literally, if you do it more than twice, automate it. Find a way to repeat it and, do the, and, and, and be able to test things. Um, bootstrapping is a big part of, of automating, just getting started with your new project, scaffolding things out. Um, you want to do your, your building process, automate that, including your source maps. Um, testing, of course, and deploying. Every step of the way should be automated. Um, this is something where I have never regretted taking an afternoon or a day and figuring out how to write a script to, to improve our process. Um, there was a, a particular bit of Python code where it took me a day. We were under a really tight deadline that I wrote almost two years ago now for deploying and, uh, our projects out. And this code has saved our ass so many times over. Um, at the time, it felt a little foolish, but it, it, it's always proven to be a really, really valuable choice to, to spend some time to automate. Uh, anything you're doing. And then lastly, document your inter internal tools like crazy. Um, I hate documenting. I'll be the first person to admit it. It is not my favorite thing to do. So our internal tools tend to be full of a lot of bad puns and jokes and just general silliness because that helps me <laughs> document them up. Um, and we also have a lot of weird names for things that also helps. <laughs> I don't know why, but you know, we, we had a library for a while called ACK just A-C-K, and, and you, can, you can have a lot of fun with that. Um, uh, now, our choice right now for doing the tooling 
is Webpack. Um, we've used Webpack uh, for multiple projects now and have been pretty happy with it. Um, the big thing that Webpack does differently uh, than Grunt or Gulp is it makes certain assumptions that you're building something for the web. Grunt and Gulp um, really allow you to build anything, um, whether you're a more file-based uh, type of thing with Grunt or, or sort of stream-based uh, with Gulp. Um, they're super, super flexible systems, but that means that if you are just doing web stuff, you often have um, a fair amount of extra work to do just to kind of get started, or you're relying on somebody else's uh, uh, existing recipe, um, which I'm not as huge a fan of. Um, Webpack is kind of batteries included, and we really like it for that. Um, the reason we're kind of moving to brunch, though, is it's even easier and even clearer what it's doing and, and how it's doing it. Um, I think either are, are perfectly good choices. Um, we used Grunt and Gulp on earlier projects, and we're generally happy with the end result, but getting them set up properly, um, where we understood every step of where it was going, took a lot of time, quite frankly. Um, the other thing that we really liked with Webpack and Brunch was working with Babel with these tools. It was super simple. Um, it, it really was straightforward. Um, the biggest issues we had was when you we went from Babel 5 to Babel 6, just because a bunch of stuff changed. Um, that was probably the most painful aspect of these, and that was it. Now, getting into the libraries that you use and trying to make sense of, of what am I going to pick to actually build this tool with, where I like to start is philosophy. What's the core idea that this library is trying to solve? What's, what's the concept behind it? Because at the, end of the, the, at the end of the day, all of the libraries that we have in JavaScript and any other language re exist to solve a particular problem in a particular way. Like, what, what's the idea behind how you're doing this? In jQuery, right, it was, let's make manipulating the DOM easy and um, cross-platform, right? Okay, great, I understand the problem they're trying to solve. Um, it maybe grew a bit past, past that, but the initial core idea made a whole lot of sense. When you're looking at the libraries that, that you want to evaluate for doing a project with, one of the first things I try to find is, can they explain it? On the site itself, for this tool, can they do the, uh, you know, treat me like I'm five, you know, treat me like I'm five years old kind of explanation of it? And um, I think more and more libraries are starting to get this. Um, a while back, when, for example, uh, RxJS came out, um, it had this incredibly wonky. Um, what was it? Uh, Rx equals observables plus link plus scheduling. As someone who'd never used it at all, that meant absolutely freaking nothing to me. I had no idea what they were talking about. Now, the newer website for that particular library does actually, I think, a great job explaining what reactive programming is and how RxJS um, helps uh, to solve a number of interesting problems. Um, but that's a, still a really important idea. Can they explain it? Not just like, hey, this is a thing that will do all the great things for you, but why? What's the idea behind it? Another thing I really love to see is, what's the inspiration for the library? Because then you can go back to the source material and read up on, where did this thing come from? Um, because sometimes people don't translate ideas exactly correctly, or they're adding to it in some interesting ways. Um, for me, that's how I end up building a big reading list of interesting programming ideas to learn about. Um, when we started jumping in to uh, doing React stuff and looked into using Redux, Redux documentation actually gets into quite a bit of where the idea came from and a big reading list to think about the ideas behind it, which I really adore. It shows a real thoughtfulness about what they're building. And then are they solving your problems? They might be solving a problem, but it might not be your problem. There's so many options for JavaScript libraries out there now you might not be facing the same issues that a particular library is trying to fix. Then lastly, and this one's really, really important to me, does it play well with others? 
you're choosing a library, not a cult. Um, and uh, coming from a, a Unix background, I've always liked the Unix philosophy of small tools that work well together. Um, that, that doesn't mean that there's not a place for monolithic tools, that there's not a, a, a place for, for that sort of thing, but personally, I tend to choose smaller things um, that, that play nicely with others. Which comes to, in my mind, when you're starting to look at these libraries, small versus big. Um, monolithic libraries, when you start looking at things like Angular uh, or Ember, um, or even all the way over there, Meteor, um, there's consistency there. You, you work in that library kind of doing everything. For building single page applications, there's, there's a real strength there for a lot of things. Um, centralized documentation, which generally improves over time. That's not to say you don't sometimes get the chair kicked out from under you, like the shift from Angular 1 to Angular 2. Um, but I would say you do have some reduced flexibility. And I would say also that there's a larger mental load for learning these, these big libraries. That being said, I recommend everybody still pick up and learn as much as they can about a large library, even if it's not something you're going to use regularly, because there's a lot of great ideas in them where even if you don't end up using the library, you can just unabashedly steal the good ideas, which is a huge amount of programming. Find the good ideas wherever you can and steal them. Um, the other part of this is documentation. Um, Bad documentation means bad software. It just does. Even if this, what the software does is absolutely amazing, if the docs aren't consistent, if the docs aren't clear, it doesn't matter. You know, there are people out there, oh, just read the code. Uh, if you can't explain to me what you're doing in human prose, I'm going to have a hard time with that. No matter what, I can't get all of the ideas from it, you know, all of the strength of it from just reading the code. Um, you also want to see unit tests whenever possible, um, as much as possible. Um, code coverage, showing that people cares. I mean, even when there isn't complete code coverage, people having unit tests and taking the time to do the documentation signals. We're serious about this. This isn't just some idea we had that we're throwing up on GitHub and NPM and, yeah, maybe this is a thing. Who knows? Um, you should read the docs and, and read all of them. Uh, I am, um, I don't know why I have this gene with, that allows me to read technical documentation and not fall asleep. Um, my wife, who's also a programmer, does not. She doesn't know how I can do it. Um, I pass this on to my, my children, my, my eldest. Anytime we get a new board game or a video game, he reads the manual. Like, before he plays the game, it's awesome, but it's also really infuriating because he consistently kicks my ass on the very first try because he's read the manual and I haven't. Um, <laughs> uh, and then if possible, read the code. I've learned so much reading other people's code, particularly big libraries where they've done the work to do the documentation and do the unit tests. I've been writing software since I was 11 years old. Um, I, I've been building web pages and, and web stuff um, since 96. So I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm constantly learning. And one of the best ways I'm constantly learning is reading other people's code. Um, we get into another thing about the libraries that I tend to feel is important. Um, uh, Douglas Crockford um, on JavaScript from, um, I think at the time he was from Yahoo, uh, said that he felt that JavaScript was lisp in C's clothing. And I think that's true. It's got a C-like syntax, but fundamentally, um, the power, the reason people have been able to do all the crazy weird stuff that they do with JavaScript has been because of its functional background. Um, and I tend to prefer libraries that take into them functional ways of thinking in terms of making clean functions that do not have uh, side effects. When you build stuff in this way, when you start building stuff in this way, if you didn't sort of grow up programming in that way, it can feel like tying your hand behind your back, right? It really, really can, because I didn't come to functional programming until relatively recently. Um, I did some in school, but it, it wasn't a real fundamental way of thinking. And then you realize you tie your arm behind your back, and then you can fly, <laughs> is what it ends up actually doing. You can do such cool stuff with functional programming. Um, immutable data ends up becoming a huge aspect of, of what we do and how we do it. 
um, one-way data binding, chaining, all these things you see in great libraries. So, uh, um, and reactivity. Um, our choice when we're building single page applications right now is uh, our core thing is Lodash, React, and Redux. So Lodash is your utility belt of all of the great functional stuff you need to move data around and, and uh, uh, get things going. Um, utility level, React um, from Facebook, which um, it can be big and bloated at times, but the way of thinking about your components and sticking them together I think is incredibly valuable. And even if React goes away, I think the ideas around it um, will last a very long time. And you're seeing, it, you're seeing the concepts be ported all over the place. Uh, and then Redux is a way of doing your data models um, in a way that uh, um, works very well with React, that are immutable, um, and you have a, a one-way binding to your data. Um, it's really, um, it can take a little bit to initially learn, but it's incredibly powerful, and all three things play well with others. Um, Redux has, uh, it isn't specifically made for React, um, and, and vice versa. They all just kind of play nicely. Now, um, there are options away from the big boys that are out there that can help you solve different problems in different ways. Um, sometimes you're dealing with an issue where you have file size, where um, you need things to be smaller. Um, you just want to think differently. Um, some of the options that we like, that we've worked with, um, Vue.js, um, which is a, a uh, very small library for doing front-end dev, um, uh, really just the view layer, um, building components and stacking them together. Um, if you like the ideas behind React, um, but don't necessarily want the full load of how it works, I think Vue's pretty nice. Um, Zepto replaces the core selector aspect of jQuery. Um, if, you just, if you just need that, um, it does a really good job of it. Um, Riot, which further takes the ideas of React and makes it that much smaller and simpler. Um, it doesn't necessarily uh, play as well with some other third-party libraries i found as React does. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but um, there's a huge amount of mind share right now around React. And then if you really want to go nuts, you have Meteor on the, the front end and the back end, and you just think about your app uh, uh, working in both places, which is pretty cool in its own right. Um, there is less developer weight behind these, um, but that doesn't mean that if it solves your problem perfectly, you shouldn't go there. Um, other great libraries that we're huge fans of, um, D3.js, uh, if you're doing data visualization at all, take the time to learn the basics of this. Um, yes, it is one of those libraries that makes you feel stupid starting out with it. Um, like I said, I've been programming since I was 11, and it made me feel stupid. Um, because I had not written data viz code in this way. But once you grok it, it's so powerful. We end up using it in so many projects. Um, RxJS for reactive programming. Now, admittedly, this is one where we have not done a ton of work with, but the idea of working with observables and data streams, I think, is incredibly powerful. And at, I, I see it as a future for a lot of the way that, that we're going to end up working with code in, um, going forward. Um, I'll be the first to admit I hate testing. I suck at it. I'm not good at test-driven development. Um, I, I have always tried, um, and I'm always looking for tools that help make it more simple. Um, right now, Jest is my favorite from a JavaScript side because it just makes a lot of the boilerplate crap go away. Um, looking into other libraries that help you do automatic fuzzing and things like that, we're just starting to explore that space now, though. Um, moment, because date programming sucks everywhere. You know, that la if you're dealing with dates, it just sucks. You screw it up all the time. You know, it just, it's not fun. Moment help makes it a lot easier. And um, if you're not using jQuery but need to do uh, Ajax type stuff, SuperAgent's wonderful. Um, it, works on, and it works on Node and uh, in the browser. The last thing here is you can't stop swimming. This is not a place where you can go and specialize and pick your, that thing you're running with and that's it. You're always going to have to be swimming and learning new things. You can either take that as a negative or take it as a positive. For me, it's a positive because I'm always learning new stuff and it's forcing me to become a better developer every day. Um, I feel like picking a winner is a bad idea. 
Pick the things you're interested in and look at those things and constantly be looking at the other things that are happening as well. Um, find what works for you, but never stop searching for better. Um, it's constantly happening. There are incredibly smart people doing awesome stuff in this language. And because of that, because of this, this Cambrian exposure and how easy it is to share, I feel like as a language, JavaScript is growing faster than anything I've ever seen in my career. It's so easy to build something and share it and improve it. That feedback loop is so tight. Um, and, and for me, it's inspiring. And even as you know, somebody who's doing this as long as I have, being able to learn something new every day, that's pretty awesome. Uh, I hope uh, this has been useful to you guys. If you have any questions, um, I can take a couple, but that's about it. Thank you. <laughs>